my name's Michael Polarski, and uh, I have a little company called Friends of the Trees Botanicals, and I've been growing medicinal plants for, oh gosh, uh, since 1972, I suppose, but I've commercially been growing them uh, for the last 25 years, as well as wild crafting. And so over the years, I've uh, rubbed elbows with a lot of herbalists and read a lot of herb books. There's some of them in back of me right now. And so I know a little bit about medicinal herbs of a, such a vast topic. Um, and I was hoping to do this video actually from my farm today, actually out in the field, but the lighting and the distance to the Wi-Fi just made it seem like that was not a good idea. So I'm here in my office. But thanks to Finn River Farm, uh, that's where my, my, my herb patch is located. And here they are. Uh, this is just a, re a really tough time for them because they can't be open. Their business is hosting people. And so this is tough on them. But it's nice that they've come up with this way to interface with the public here. Okay. So um, now we have a nice apple in the front. Uh, okay. So a couple of preliminary remarks. We are surrounded by medicine wherever we are, unless you're on an ice sheet or up on the, in the Mount Everest or on the ocean. There's, wherever there's plants growing, there is medicine. Uh, so far in my career of, of looking around the temperate zone especially, that wherever I go, uh, any uh, ecosystem, generally about 50% or more of the plants have medicinal properties. I don't, I haven't spent enough time in the subtropics and subtropics to say if that 50% or better rule uh, holds there as well as in the temperate zone, but I wouldn't be that surprised. And so wherever you go, there's medicinal plants. And pr I would say pretty much wherever you go, there's going to be some antivirals in that mix. We could, uh, make the outlandish statement that wherever people live, that there's going to be all the me herbal medicines necessary for most health challenges and diseases found there. In other words, we don't need to export, import medicinal plants all around the globe like we do. And we certainly don't, uh, yeah, so they are, there are, you might say adequate medicines wherever we live. And so today we're gonna to be talking about a lot of things that uh, are found in our temperate zone. I might get uh, a little further afield, but mostly I'm going to stick to what we can, we can grow here or is found here. The novel coronavirus uh, is humanity's latest health challenge. And the demand for certain antiviral herbs has really uh, gone up a lot. I, my, my business has been booming. I know most of the herb businesses that I know of are, their business is booming. Some can't, a lot of them can't keep up with the, de the demand. A lot of things are going out of stock. So having your own antivirals close at hand is really a lot smarter than knowing uh, what company to buy them from. And if you're gonna buy, from anybody, you might as well get some from me, by the way, a brief word from your sponsor. Uh, we do have a catalog, it's on our friendsofthetrees.net website. So if, if there are herbs that can work, uh, that can treat viruses wherever we live, and there's a lot of them that are pretty famous at this point, isn't it interesting that our government with all their information about coronavirus has not mentioned, I don't think I've, ever, I've heard herbs mentioned once by a government agency or a health agency in the world uh, concerning this coronavirus. Nor it's also very interesting that not once have I seen any of the powers that be or any of the media point out that certain vitamins are really helpful for not getting coronavirus, specifically vitamin C. We should all be taking lots of vitamin C, vitamin D as well. Zinc lozenges are good. There's certain, those three things, and there's others, those three supplements could really reduce your chances of getting coronavirus. Isn't it interesting 
that the media and the health departments and the governments have not said a single word about us taking vitamins to for our uh, prevent getting coronavirus. Isn't that interesting? At any rate, so here I am to tell you about some of the antiviral herbs. But before I do that, I'm going to introduce three books. And I actually have written them down in the chat area up there, if anybody wanted to take them down. But uh, here's the first one, Herbal Antivirals by Stephen Herod Buner. And I'm just going to get the hang of this. And this is uh, an, an herbal book devoted just to antivirals. And so it's a, the cat's meow right now. Hundreds and thousands of people are reading it. A lot of people are making uh, formulas, herbal formulas using his advice. So we're going to look at a number of the, of the antivirals he talks about during the course of this talk. Another book which I really highly recommend is uh, the, let's see if we can back off here, The Encyclopedia of Herbs by a woman named Denny Bone, B-O-W-N. And that is one of my favorite herb books in general. It covers uh, most, a lot of the main herbs in the world. Great, inf you know, short information, but really good coverage. Uh, so I recommend that as a general rule, uh, as a general book. And the third one I'm going to recommend is, um, is the Pacific Northwest Medicinal Plants by Scott Close. And uh, let's see, there's his name. And Scott Close, this is a really recent book. And it's 120 wild herbs uh, for the Pacific Northwest that you can find here that grow wild that you can use for health and wellness. And uh, this is a really good book. I, I, get, I, I collect books like this. And I was very impressed with this one. It's recent, great photos, good information, good information on sustainability and wild crafting. So just all in all, thank you, Scott, for making this book for all of us. Now, okay, so I'm going to start with a list. Of, I, I think I have 26 herbs on my list here. We'll see how far we get. Uh, elderberry is number one, elderberry. And there's European elderberries, there's native elderberries. Don't use the native red elderberry, please. Uh, use the, uh, either the native blue elderberry or the black, the European or the Eastern US. There are, the, it, almost all of them are, are good, but uh, the European and the blue are something that we've been using a lot. And the, I grow a lot of this. Everywhere I go, I plant elderberry because the flowers are medicinal and they also make pleasant drinks. And the berries are edible and also medicinal. So it's an edible medicinal shrub that uh, grows really well here. And so it's a, it's a good, as, as a farmer, it's a good crop for me. And also we really like having it um, for customers. And right now there's a big demand for it. So right now we're selling a lot of plants of the elderberry. So you can use the flowers or the berries for the medicine, and it's really good for. It's been famous for uh, for in influenza and flus for a long time, but it's a really good antiviral. You don't think of it as a strong plant because it's an edible, but actually, it is one of our top antivirals. Another one is a plant called Chinese skullcap, Scutellaria bicolensis. And Chinese skullcap, I've been growing that for years. And the reason I like to grow Chinese skullcap is um, not only is it a good medicine, but it has one of the most beautiful indigo blue flowers of any of the herbs. So I'm just thrilled with the flowers. And so Chinese skullcap, if you can get some seeds for that or some plants, you'll really enjoy growing that. It usually takes about four years to get the root up to size enough to harvest. So it's a bit of a wait. Um, the, and then a, a common one is lemon balm. Almost all of us know lemon balm. It's, uh, it be easily becomes uh, weedy in the garden uh, and uh, it's easy to grow. Once you have it established, it can live for years. Just one of the most reliable of all the herbs and a great antiviral, has lots of uses. Uh, another one is 
Osha, or Ligusticum. Now there are many species of Ligusticum and wherever they're found in the world, the native peoples use them for medicine. Ligusticum is found uh, throughout the temperate zone, many different species. They're all medicinal and used by native peoples. It's in the Umbelliferae family and it's considered difficult to grow. And, but I'm including it here because it is not impossible to grow. I've grown it before in my gardens. And there's two ways to get it started, either from seed uh, or from cr small crown divisions. And so when I, next year or this fall, I am planning on going to the OSHA fields uh, here in the Cascades um, and get there at the time when the seeds are ripe or just barely uh, at the early ripening stage, I'm going to harvest the seed and I'm going to send them to whoever wants seed. The trick to growing uh, Ligusticum or Osha from seed is to do fall sowing of the seed rather than letting it get, get dry and, and store over winter or for several years. It, does, it likes to be sown as soon as it falls to the ground, so to speak. So. I want to be able to get fresh seed to people. So stay tuned if you're interested in some fresh seed. And I'll also be harvesting a lot of the roots for these orders I'm getting. And the larger roots will have a lot of small, you might say, sub crowns. And so I can cut those little babies off and sell those to people and they can plant them and then grow them out to be a larger plant. So again, it takes some years but a, a lovely plant. So Osha is, has a reputation of being over harvested in the wild in some places at any rate. Uh, and so we do have to be, we, we can't just rely on wild for Osha. We need more people growing it. So I hope that some of you will rise to the challenge and work on uh, getting some Osha growing and, and working with uh, Osha. Now, if you don't have Osha, but you're looking for that uh, Osha, uh, kick. Consider using lovage. Lovage is a uh, levisticum officinal and it's closely related to legusticum. In fact, at one time it was it was botanically classified as legusticum levisticum. So it, it actually, um, so it's quite similar. It isn't as strong, but it is a good, uh, it is a good medicinal herb. It's very super easy to grow and uh, much more available in the trade. So if you get a chance, uh, grow a, a lovage or two in your garden as well. That's um, a good substitute. Um, the, next, the next really big uh, antiviral I'll mention is Lomatium dissectum. Now this is another umbiliferae, uh, and just like the Osha and the, and the lovage, and it's grown in, it's found in Eastern Washington, uh, growing on dry, rocky, or gravelly, or sandy slopes. It, it only grows where there's super free drainage in the soil. It dries out in the summer and goes completely dormant. It does all of its uh, growing and maturing of its seeds in spring through, uh, through late spring, and then in summer it goes dormant. It's very difficult to grow uh, in your garden. It's possible. I've done it, that one as well, but it's difficult the, because it needs that dry summer dormant phase. And for all of us in Western Washington, we don't get that good of a summer dry uh, spell. I, it, it probably would work if you put it in, the, in a really uh, coarse substrate, like they like say, plant it in straight gravel or in a sand pit. There actually is found some Lomation dissectum in the, uh, in the San Juan Islands on the rockiest, hottest bluffs um, on, the, on the islands, very rare. So I wouldn't advise to go find it there and harvest it. Uh, but there's a lot of it in Eastern Washington, all the way up into British Columbia, Alberta, Oregon, Idaho, Montana. So Lomatium is very abundant and very common in Eastern Washington if you're in the right habitat, mainly bitterbrush habitat. So the, the trick to growing Lomatium, again, is um, fall sowing seed. And I, one, one 
inadvertent experiment I did. I was cleaning Lomation dissectum seeds um, because I was filling a seed order. And I had all these seeds and I was cleaning away and a lot of them fell on, the, on our gravel driveway where I was doing the cleaning. And so behold, lo and behold, uh, that fall and next spring, hundreds of Lomatium seedlings sprung up uh, just, just in the gravel driveway. They loved it. They thought that a gravel driveway was the perfect place to germinate. So a little tip if you wanna, uh, again, we could supply seed of that. Hard, we can't do offshoots on that one. So Lomatium is, a, is one of the strongest antivirals in the Western US. So it would mean that um, it would be one of the strongest antivirals in the world. It's really a world-class antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, uh, antiparasite. It uh, kills most disease organisms, uh, you might say, on contact. And it, uh, it um, I call it, what I, I use Lomatium a lot, a lot. I make a lot of medicine with it. Uh, and distributed it to hundreds of people with good results. And it doesn't taste that good, but it is a very strong antiviral. Let's see, what else would I say about Lomation? I guess I would use it as an example. If if it's one of the strongest antivirals in the Western US, what is the strongest antiviral in the Eastern US or in Mexico or in Brazil or in the Congo Basin or in Vietnam? Wherever you live in the world, there are going to be some uh, powerful, you know, strong antivirals and maybe some moderate or maybe not so strong, but everywhere you go, there's going to be antivirals and there's going to be medicines. And so uh, today, of course, we're just going to cover the ones that I know of more from uh, temperate zones. But wherever you go, uh, it would be interesting. It would be good for the general populace to know what uh, the antivirals are in their neighborhood, if needed. Okay, another one is a plant called bone set, and a lot of people think, oh, it's for setting bones. Well, there's a uh, herb called knit bone, and that's comfrey, knit bone, for knitting bones. But bone set isn't for setting uh, bones. It's said that the name came about because it's for fevers that make it feel like your bones are breaking. In other words, very, really tough fevers with a lot of pain. Um, bone set can help break those fevers. So it's a very strong, um, uh, herb for st stopping fevers or breaking fevers that are just really strong. But bone set is also an antiviral and uh, uh, Herod Buhner is uh, recommending it in his formulas. And so it's uh, really um, increased in, in demand just in the, in the last little bit. Bone set is really easy to grow from crown divisions. And I grow a fair amount of bone set. I always try to have a big patch of them in to fill the demand. I've had very poor luck trying to grow it from seed. It seems to be difficult from seed, uh, probably not impossible, but better to buy uh, crown divisions or young plants if you, if you can. But once you do have it, it's very long lived, like decades and decades, um, or I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating here, uh, but at least a decade or, or longer. They can be very long lived as a, as a clumping herbaceous perennial. And they don't run around and, and escape. They pretty much stay in one spot. I've never had them, unfortunately, I've never had them sort of like spread. They just stay where you put them. So that, and say a bone set is a composite family, Eupatorium perfoliatum. Okay. So maybe I'll see if there's any questions at this point. So we have a, a number of people on here. Does anybody have questions about any of those particular herbs? Hey, Craig. I just went ahead and unmuted everyone. So uh, folks should be able to go ahead and ask questions. We can tell who has kids or if they're cooking supper or lunch. 
<laughs> doing carpentry. <laughs> so if there's no questions, I'll just keep yakking. I have a question, actually. Yeah. Um, so you were talking a little bit about OSHA and Lovage, and I know that there's Lagusticum porteri, I think, is the, co the common one that most people use. And then Lagusticum grayi, is that our local species? And how is that different than the Lagusticum officinale? I had never heard of just straight up Lovage before. Uh huh. Um, well, there's a couple questions in there. The Porterized, the, the main one that's called OSHA, it's from the, the more like the Southern Rocky Mountains or middle, maybe the middle Rocky Mountains. It's famous, all the Mexicans, all the native peoples, all the tribes uh, down in the Southwest, they all know Porterized uh, as OSHA. And the names up here, of course, are gonna be different. The gray eye is native to Oregon primarily. And it is, it, it, I would say that the Porter eye, the one in the Rockies, is the largest, as far as I know, uh, the ones I'm familiar with, the largest of the Lagusticums. It's quite a bit, it's a, it's a large plant. Our uh, gray eye doesn't tend to get as large. The one I harvest up here in the East Cascades in Washington is called Lagusticum canbii. And canby's lovage. See, there's that same common name. Mm. And, and so the, the so they vary in size and porterize the one that's most used most you know it's less the other ones are lesser used in our neck of the woods oh, okay. <clears throat> and as far as the as far as the comparing the strength of the lovage the levisticum to the legusticum i'm not good enough of an herbalist to be able to say i i i'm sure i'm sure it's not as strong as osha for for sure, but it definitely has, it's definitely a, a good herb, um, but, uh, and how far you can push that, uh, that comparison, I'm not sure. So um, stay tuned. Thank you. Okay, anyone else there? Um, yeah, um, do you happen to know, um, like the mode of action of any of these herbs on the body? Um, well, not, not specifically. I, I'm not an herbalist. I uh, never claimed to be an herbalist. I'm a wild mm -hmm. crafter and grower. So mainly I'm going to, I should probably say, if, you know, uh, maybe get, cover a bit more on the growing here. But um, the, the modes of action, I can't say that much other than uh, generally speaking, uh, as an antiviral, it, what it does is kill the viruses. Mm -hmm. And as I said, in the, from the case of Lomatium, it just, uh, I think of it as a, uh, that it just, once you take it, it goes into the body and it just penetrates, you know, gets into your bloodstream and goes to all parts of the body and kills the, um, kills whatever disease organisms are, are, are there. It's used, Lomation, for instance, is used in uh, HIV AIDS patients, uh, hepatitis C patients, uh, Bars Epstein, People that have a, a long-term viruses, they're, it, it isn't going to eliminate those, some of these kinds of viruses, but it really kills a lot of them. So it reduces the viral load and it really helps uh, keep the patient from getting a secondary illnesses. So, but in, in my own uh, experience, when I take Lomation, if, if I'm, the, the time to take it uh, and in terms of lomation, probably I would say this is probably in general for antivirals or herbal medicine in general, is at the early onset of a sickness. You uh, All of a sudden, I feel like I'm getting a, uh, a cold or a flu or something's trying to get me. And these days, of course, with COVID, if I started feeling like, like I was going about to start, I was just starting to get some kind of an illness, I immediately take, um, take a stiff dose of the uh, Lomation or a formula with Lomation in it so that um, it can go into the body. And at that early stage when you, there aren't too many of them, before they've had a chance to really breed up in numbers, you can knock it out at that early stage. So I, I find it really useful as an early onset a remedy for, for viruses. It works great for colds, flus, and coronavirus is quite similar to the uh, cold coronavirus. It's just, it's just we're not used to it. 
but it's um so I one of the reasons, things I like to say about it using a medical or a military terminology is that it's a search and destroy kind of agents. It goes in there, it searches and it destroys the viruses. Um, and then of course your body then has to uh, flush all the viruses out of the system, all the dead bodies uh, and their waste products, etc. So you have a debris load, you might say, in the body. We always have some sort of a, a load of things that are breaking down in our bodies and we need to eliminate them. If our elimination system doesn't work, we're in bad shape. And so uh, I, when I'm taking an antiviral, I'm going to be taking as well uh, lymphatic uh, lymphagogues, uh, things that will help the lymphs function better and the colon function better so that my elimination system can get rid of the debris. So that's a sort of a, a follow-on to the to the killing of the disease organisms. You also have to be able to eliminate all that debris. Um, and I find, and and I've read in the in the literature that uh, a lot of times a, a disease that you might pick up uh, a, a few of you know some organisms during the day, at night when your body is sleeping, is a lot of times when they tend to really sort of ramp up their activity and really go for it. And so, if I wake up at night with a with a sense of uh, a, with a sense of impending doom or a tickle or a cough, I I get up in the middle of the night and I take that I take that stiff dose because I want to knock it out at that early stage. Much easier. Once you're heavily, you know, if someone has a very bad flu, a very bad cold, or or coronavirus, something, just taking uh, uh, some antivirals may assist the recovery. It may reduce the severity. But it isn't going to prop is very unlikely to miraculously uh, cure them right off the bat like a silver bullet. It's um, the early onset is where it's most effective for these antivirals. Um, so does that help, Craig? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Let me let me go on with some other uh, plants here, and then and then and then uh, we'll see where we go next here. Let's see. Um, so, uh, licorice. Licorice is, uh, we tend to think of licorice as something that's in candy, it's sweet, it's tasty, um, but licorice, the, the medicinal licorice root has a lot of uh, useful things. Um, Evelyn, maybe it would be good to um, mute people again uh, for a bit. Um, uh, I'm getting a little feedback here, okay. So, licorice, there's European, American, and Chinese. And the European licorice in, in particular is what I'm going to be talking about now. L licorice is, um, takes a long time to, again, it's one of those four year or longer before you harvest it uh, as a root. It's pretty, uh, it's relatively easy to grow from seed and also from uh, root divisions. So once you have it growing, you can then cut up the roots and every piece will grow. Uh, you know, it, it, all, a couple inches of roots, all you need. And so I just did a bunch of licorice root division from an old patch I had. So licorice is fun to chew on. It tastes good. And it's uh, a great addition to uh, probably any, uh, many medicinal herb formulas. It's interesting that licorice is probably uh, maybe the most used Chinese uh, uh, herb in Chinese traditional medicine. They use their, of course, their Chinese version, but they use it in all kinds of formulas. It uh, assists other things doing their work. It's a legume, um, and it sends out runners. So once you have a once you have a one started it will send out runners and more will pop up and then it will send out further runners and more will pop up. So it eventually can take over a, a fairly large area. Okay, and astragalus, this is another, another um, legume, another Chinese medicinal, astragalus membranaceus. And that's pretty easy to grow from seed as well. Again, it's about a four-year plant to get a good-sized plant. The problem with astragalus uh, growing it is that gophers love it. I once had a, a, a super large patch of astragalus, 
and they ate about one fourth of it each year each year until basically <laughs> there was uh there was only uh, one or two left so the um if you have really a lot of problem with voles gophers um rodents then then uh that makes it a little more problematic but i just learned a new trick this last uh, this last fall because uh, the the voles were eating some of my crop plants the other roots and so uh, i read that you if you uh, get castor oil i buy it by the gallon so, you know uh, thin it out with some water and pour it around the plants that uh, the rodents do not like the castor oil and so I was able to protect my astragalus and, and licorice and, and other of my special plants that they might eat uh, by using that uh, bit of castor oil um, around them. And, and uh, okay, so I'm, here's three that you can grow in your, or four herbs you can grow in your lawn. So, so far we've been mainly thinking about growing things in the garden. But here's uh, things to grow in the lawn. There's a plant called self-heal or heal all, Prunella vulgaris. It's a small mint family plant, loves to grow in lawns. I, you know, you'll, see, you'll see them in lawns off and on. I would say that uh, if you could get some seed, you might uh, experiment with uh, incorporating it in, in parts of a thin lawn, see if you can get it going and then it can spread from there. But self-heal, is a relatively common, it's a, a weedy plant. There's native and non-native uh, self-heal or prunellas here in the Northwest. One kind's taller, one kind is shorter. The shorter, they both would work in the lawn, but the shorter probably uh, even more so. So they, but it's not recognized, uh, used that much in herbal medicine in the recent, uh, the re last old oh, 50 years or so. But I was just at a lab yesterday delivering our herbs and asking about antivirals so I could get uh, some more list of antivirals for this workshop here. And they said self-heal is really, is really being, uh, is one of the things they're using in their uh, coronavirus formulas. So self-heal, you can grow in your lawn, you can mow it and it will just keep going. Another one, Another antiviral that we wouldn't normally think of it isn't as famous is viola odorata. In other words, the very fragrant spring flowering violet, which I just saw on the lawn in uh, flowering in, uh, in Port Townsend the other day when I was walking around. It's not uncommon in lawns. It's not, well, maybe that's not that common, but I, I do I have seen it in dozens of lawns over the years. So it uh, is one of the most fragrant and early flowering of the plant. So it's just a delight to have around if you just uh, just walking on it or, or just the scent will just waft up to you. So it's a great, uh, great fragrance. And it's also a really good antiviral, interestingly enough. And again, it likes the lawns or the edges or under the, under the, in shady areas. It, it can grow in quite a bit of shade. In fact, that's where I generally find it is in shady areas or, or on lawns as well, not necessarily shady, but shade or, or sun. Uh, another lawn plant that I, I wouldn't necessarily call it an antiviral, but it has so many useful medicinal properties is yarrow. Yarrow can be a tall plant, but it, it persists quite well in a mowed lawn. And so uh, you could have yarrow in your lawn. And then of course, uh, dandelion. What's a dan what's a, what is a lawn, a complete lawn without dandelions in it? It's amazing that people spend so much money trying to kill one of the most useful plants in the world. It's, one of the, it's a great medicinal, the, especially the root. Uh, and uh, it's the, the leaves, the flowers, everything is edible, including the roots. So it's an edible and a medicinal that's very common, and sort of, you might say, somewhat underappreciated world-class herb that you can grow in your lawn. So if you don't have enough dandelion in your lawn, I suggest getting some seeds, spreading them around. Uh, so a medicinal lawn would be a great uh, asset to the, to the home instead of just that barrel, just that plain old grass. 
Um, now, here's another antiviral that's very famous, and that is St. John's wort. St. John's wort can be grown in the garden or it can be found in the wild. It's a common weed. I find it in Western Washington and Eastern Washington. Mainly in Eastern Washington is where the really big patches are. I, I would love to find more big patches in Western Washington. I drive 300 miles one way to get to my, my really best St. John's wort patches. That's the kind of places where I can go out and harvest 100 pounds in one day. That's a kind of a long day to get 100 pounds, but possible. Uh, but here in Western Washington, you'll generally find it along roads. It doesn't seem to leave roads very far, generally. And so a lot of times the roads, if they're too busy, you don't want to harvest there. But uh, a lot of times up in the mountains, you'll find them along logging roads or very little used roads. So there's a possibility there, but you can also grow them in your garden. Now they're a noxious weed. They're listed as a noxious weed. It used to be illegal to grow St. John's wort in your garden in Washington, but it became such good money for a while that the um, various people petitioned the government to take it off the do not grow list. So, uh, so I believe it still is now legal to grow in your garden. Uh, it will move around a little bit in the garden, which is fine with me because uh, I can use a lot of St. John's wort. Um, and so St. John's wort is antiviral, plus it's also stress reducer, and it also repairs damaged nerve endings. A lot of people think of St. John's wort. Oh, yes, it's easy. It's a, it's a feel-good herb, makes you feel better. It's good for stress. Uh, but uh, it it actually the reason it's so good for stress and for the nerves is that it repairs damaged nerve endings and not that many people repair damaged nerve endings or not that many herbs. So um, St. John's wort is um, in our stressful times it would be a great one to add to your protocol. And now I'm I'm going to uh, look at a few spices and then we'll. Let's see if we can have some more questions here. But I, I have looked at lists of spices uh, many times, and I can't, I, I can't think of a single spice plant herb that's used for a spice that isn't medicinal at the same time. So spicy foods uh, are also have a lot of medicinal value. Now, some that in particular that are antiviral are oregano, and we all, a lot of people know oregano oil or oil of oregano uh, that is really, uh, really high quality medicinal. It kills a lot of disease organisms. So oregano in your food you, and um, garden sage, the common garden sage, salvia officinalis is uh, again, antiviral, basil, uh, so when you're eating uh, your pesto, that's a great medicinal as well. And uh, rosemary, rosemary antiviral as well. Ginger, it's a more difficult to grow ginger here, but possible. There's a greenhouse plant or a plant for a large pot. A fennel and garlic. Uh, the garlic as a, as a, Raw is, you might say, medicinal, and garlic as a cooked uh, herb or as, as a spice and when, and when it's cooked uh, is, loses a lot of its medicinal properties. So it's, it's, it's medicinal cooked as well, but for the really strong medicinal properties of garlic, that's when you use it raw. So we have a lot of our spices that we can be using as well in our protocol, and that's one thing that is generally not out of stock. I mean, it may be difficult to find astragalus or lomatium or osha, but you can you pretty much can always find oregano, basil, rosemary, garlic, and the spices. So uh, if you wanna use medicinal herbs, but, but not be caught using medicinal herbs, if they ever make it um, uh, illegal, you could still be using spices. So probably not go that far. Okay. So uh, spices, lawns, 
and in your garden and of course wild crafting. So uh, let's maybe where we got another 16 minutes here. Maybe be, maybe let's try see if there's any more questions or comments at this time. Or anybody you can, if you want to ask about an herb that I haven't mentioned, you could do that as well. So let's try a, unmute again and see if uh, there's any questions. I'm going to go ahead and let everyone uh, unmute themselves just so that we don't have a bunch of uh, feedback okay. folks. Okay, um, great. People probably know that the mute button is off on their left lower screen there. Michael, do you sell uh, glyceriza or licorice? Um, plants. Oh, I do actually. I, I have. Uh, I actually have some uh, glyceriza glabra, the European, for sale right now. I, I we I I sell. I just finished selling thousands of herb plants in the last month or so. Uh, I do big herb sales uh, every year, and uh, we pretty much just ended our herb sale except for black cohosh. But if you wanted, a, if you wanted a couple of licorice, uh, I still have some. So we could send you a few licorice plants. You would send me a, send me an email after the after the call. Friends of the it's friends of the trees at yahoo.com is my email. So if anybody uh, uh, will do, and then can you speak a little bit more about propagation of glyceriza? I didn't know that we could grow that in our climate. Oh yeah, here I'm going to put my uh, email up there on the side in the chat. Uh, yes, I've been growing uh, glyceriza for years. It, it likes a Mediterranean climate. It should grow fine here in uh, uh, here in Western Washington. I must say I I haven't been growing that much here. I mainly I grow east of the mountains, so I'm kind of newer. Have not had as much as much experience west of the mountains here, but. I'm sure it will grow. I have licorice growing in my garden right now. I have the uh, Chinese and the European and the American licorice. I have three kinds currently growing in the garden. Uh, and as, so it's, it's, as I said, pretty easy, uh, both from you know the seed or and or uh, root divisions. The I guess the the problem I would say with growing it is that. Since it pops up erratically, I kind of like, you know, I like herbs that just sort of like line, you know, you put them in a row and they stay in a row nice and straight. They don't wander. That would be like bone set or, or hyssop uh, thyme. There's a lot of herbs that will just stay in that row where you put them. But the, 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 the licorice spreading and, and coming up kind of hither and thither uh, makes it a little harder to do weeding and, and mulching and care makes it a little bit just a little bit more of, of a challenge, but uh, not too bad. I would say that if I was going to grow licorice, I would do a really heavy mulch uh, for several feet either side of the plants so that as they send up the new shoots, you don't have to like find it where they are coming up out of the weeds. In other words, you want to have a really thick mulch so that the, the, the licorice will have no problem penetrating the mulch, but you won't have all those pesky weed seedlings coming up. So a lot, uh, I definitely, the heavy mulch is especially called for in those kind of uh, crops. Thank you. Do you have the same gopher or vole problem with licorice as you do with astragalus? I, I have not noticed that. Um, I, I've, I, my, the place I grew the astragalus that were eaten very heavily the I have had the licorice growing there for years and uh, with no apparent problem. There was still a big patch of it when I went back, and this is oh, this is a 15-year-old patch. I put it in 15 years ago. It's still it's still there. Whereas the stragglus, I, I it would be much more uh, unlikely it would still be there. So I, they they I'm I'm so far so good. I would say. Cool. Thank you so much. Okay, Lauren, where are you at, by the way? Uh, I'm actually staying out at Compass Rose Farms. Oh, okay. You're close here then. And I know, yeah. where, I know where Mahala is. Where's Craig from? 
very easy. Um, yeah, I'm here in Port Townsend. Okay, so it's all kind of local. It's a local group here. Okay, great. Well, we're recording this, so we'll be putting it up for uh, people in farther away places as well. Okay. Yeah, so uh, any other questions here? I love questions, and I, I don't have to think. Um, yeah, I was really interested that uh, garlic loses a lot of its medicinal value after it's uh, cooked. And I was wondering if um, all these other plants were like that and kind of like the implications of that for herbal teas, for example, or yeah, do you think all these things lose their value when they're boiled? Or oh, cooked? by no means. Some of them actually uh, release their value when they're heated or cooked. So oh. some, things, some things are going to improve by the, by the cooking. Other things are going to be uh, in, uh, you know, depleted by the cooking. So it really varies. Oh. But we do so much of our herbs by, um, by making a tea. Now, it's, as a tincture maker, it's interesting that there's um, a lot of medicine is taken uh, by tincture form in Europe and North America in particular. And the, a lot of manufacturers use a dried herb to make the tincture and other, th other, uh, uh, other manufacturers mainly use fresh. And I've been studying this for some time in my, in my, uh, in my in my experience or in my studies, I would say that uh, something something like maybe eighty percent of all herbs are best tinctured fresh rather than dried and then tinctured. You'll you lose something just in that drying phase, which is oftentimes you might say a heating phase as well. Some herbs. Uh, retain, they can be dried and retain their properties quite well, either dried or fresh. So they can be used either way. And a few herbs are enhanced by the drying process and are best used tinctured dried. And that would be things like orange peel and ginger. And there's a, maybe a few other things, but by and large, um, fresh is, is definitely better. Now, if we look at uh, nettles, for instance, now I'm not touting uh, nettles as an antiviral, but if uh, we, we eat a lot of nettles and uh, we make a lot of nettle tea, it's a fantastic medicinal rich in minerals, et cetera. Uh, and we, we cook it if we're gonna eat it because of all the stinging hairs. But if you wanted, I think the most, the most optimum nettle medicine I would think that you could press out the fresh juice and, and use the fresh juice uh, without cooking it would probably be getting you some things that you wouldn't get otherwise. So um, I, I think that, uh, that here in the US, we, that there could be a lot more thought given to how can we consume herbs uh, more in a fresh form rather than in a dried or form or a tea uh, or cooked in some way. So that, it, that would be a great conversation to have about, oh, maybe five or to 10 really uh, very knowledgeable herbalists and herbal manufacturers sit here and, and look at different herbs one by one and see what, they, see what uh, kind of information we get. I will point out that in, that most Chinese medicinals are consumed in China as a, as a simmered tea. In other words, not just like a light simmering, but they, they really cook their herbs down quite a, quite a bit, a lot of their herbs. And uh, so they're taking strong decoctions. And if you go to Ayurvedic medicine from India, a lot of the Ayurvedic medicine people, they actually ingest the herbs. They don't make a tincture and throw part of them out. They don't make tea and then throw part of them out. They actually eat the, eat the whole herb in some way or another. So, and what, and how can we, what is the most efficacious way to consume our herbs is something that there's, um, uh, we need to spend more time on that. And uh, I, I would love to go to a workshop 
specifically on that by somebody. So I, so that's a that's a really good question there, Craig. The the cooking time versus not, and as, again, it's going to be all across the board. Some plants are going to be yes, some no. It, it, it's uh, there's no one size fits all on this one. Fascinating. Thank you. I'll do some experimenting maybe then. <laughs> okay. Okay. So well, we only have six minutes left here. So I'm maybe just going to mention uh, just a couple more here. Echinacea, of course, is just um, a very famous medicinal. And uh, lately I've been, you know, there's a lot of people that want it. It's antiviral, but it's all antibacterial. It has a lot of different uses, and it's a beautiful plant to grow as well. And it's quite easy to grow, at least the purpurea is. The, maybe the strongest of the echinaceas is Echinacea angustifolia, and that one grows in the Great Plains. And generally, it's said that it doesn't grow very well in, in uh, Western Washington, this kind of a climate. It likes the dry interior climate with a uh, colder winters, I believe. There's another plant called red root, uh, which I use in my lomatium and my antiviral formulas. Red root is a native uh, plant that mainly is found east of the mountains. It is found west occasionally. You can grow it in your garden. I have grown it. You can buy the plants in certain nurseries. Um, but it, in my experience, the best red root are, is plants that are like, oh, let's say 25 years old or so. In other words, older plants have much redder roots than the newer ones. So if you want to get good red root, you pretty much are going to have to go out there and wildcraft it in uh, eastern Washington and the East Cascades, or it's, it's found all the way across uh, eastern Washington in, in uh, forests or forest edges especially after fires. So there's, I, I, I guess a question could be, could I grow red root as good as nature can? Probably not. Uh, can I grow yarrow as good as nature can? Probably pretty close. Uh, can I grow dandelion as good as nature can? Probably. Uh, so there's some, um, there's, there's always been a debate within the herb community as to whether a cultivated plant is best or a wildcrafted plant. Uh, the a generally accepted uh, is that wildcrafted plants are gonna be stronger than the same thing that's been cultivated. However, since some herbs have been over harvested in the wild, then some buyers will prefer it to be from a cultivated source just because they don't want to contribute to further decimation of, its, uh, of it in the natural habitat. So, so as a wild crafter and a farmer, I am very, uh, I love wild crafting. It's a lot less work. God, you might say, nature grows the, the herbs and I just have to pick it. It's just so much <clears throat> easier in general, than going out and wild crafting. Uh, the, the, and I wild craft all around the state of Washington and even beyond Washington occasionally, I'm going to Idaho and Montana a little bit. And so I just made two trips to Eastern Washington. It's like, it's, uh, you know, they were like uh, 500 mile round trip, 600 mile round trip to go get wild crafted medicinals. And it was really dicey there uh, in account of the lockdown. Uh, could I go out there? As a farmer, I'm allowed to go out and pursue my business. Um, right now, there's nobody checking. There's no checkpoints to check you know, that you're actually out there on, on the right business. But I could see a time in the future if, if as uh, pandemics may get worse or uh, things, the society suffers more from various hits that I might not be able to make these long trips to go get all this <clears throat> wild crafted material. And, and so I hedge my bets by having a farm that's just down the road that I could bike to so that I'm always going to have a good access to medicinal plants uh, right nearby. So it's, I recommend that everybody learns how to wild craft. And I also recommend that everybody have herbs growing in the yard or in their garden so that if you can't get out, you still have what you need. So uh, 
local food and local medicine are the wave of the future. And so I believe we're at our time here and Evelyn will have to um, finish up here, but thank you all for attending and uh, I hope this has been useful. You can grow your own medicine. You don't have to, um, right. You, you don't rely just on the system. Take care of yourself. Be well. Thanks so much for uh, jumping in here, Michael. This was super informative and uh, definitely learned a couple of things and I'm excited for uh, future talks. And bye everyone. Thanks for joining. It was lovely to have you all here and perhaps we'll see you again. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll try to do this probably weekly for a few weeks. All right, awesome. stay tuned. All right, take care folks.